into it. That's the big deal. We want the air to be secure in that. Okay, that's about four minutes. Isn't that a relief when it's over? You might have noticed that it went in at about here, and it's about three quarters of an inch increased in volume. Then you've done that. You might notice that when you're using a blender anyway, they, they say take it to a certain level, and then no, you know, it's got a maximum level on it. So this is the level that we're using in this case. Now, mm. Let me find for you a little spoon. Come over here. Um, look at that. Isn't that a lovely look to it? It's full of air and that is oh, it's it really does get into your palate, and it's just delicious. Mm. Mm. Not a bad color either, when you think about it, for mac and cheese. So let's take these pasta here, which by now should have had just that little bit of extra time. They feel really good. Um, Ah, perfect, good. So what I want to do with that now is to just drain the liquid off from the pasta. So remember what it was when we put it in, so it's doubled in size now. Right? So we put that down into the pan and then pour on the sauce. Are you looking, are you able to see? And, oh, you are, well done. You're so good. Thank you. Yeah. Now, I've used about half of it. Let's, let's stop and see what that actually looks like. I think it's important that you know that, that you're gonna have more sauce. Would that be about what you would feel that a mac and cheese should look like in a dish. Yeah, that amount of sauce, about that. Yeah, cool. Okay, so we're going to put that on one side and we'll reheat that when we're done. Now I've got exactly almost half of that left. What would I do with something like this? Everywhere where you've got a creamy white sauce, Every time that you can think of doing that, you have a provision here. Now, what you can do um, with this particular um, unit that I have is it also has these small um, cups um, where you can put um, some of this material. And I tested this out with parsnips. That's what's in this one. And um, it's perfect. It goes in the deep freeze, brings out overnight, defrost it, and it's immediately available. So it's several meals that you've got prepared when you make that quantity of, of sauce, well, at least two meals. Um, so that goes over that side. Does that make, does that make sense? Huh? I know it makes sense to you. This is my friend. <laughs> but I'm still interested about whether it makes friends to you at home. You got it? Okay. So, it's <clears throat> so far it's mac and cheese, but where's the cheese? And that's I'm going to add in a little bit um, for you. All right, let's look, let's look back now at, at the oats. Remember how they did look? And now, you see, as I would simply stir them together, this is where the flakes, because they have softened on the outside, 
those are now when you beat it together they will become what you normally expect to have with oatmeal it's really beginning to thicken up perfectly now you could do this whole process which is you know about six seven minutes to come to the boil then you could put the lid on the top and you could put that in the fridge at night time you could do all of that at night time if you've got one of those frenetic families in the morning and you really want to hit the ground running that can be in there now th there's a rule on this one and i have this little machine here it, it's a probe thermometer and at the moment I put that in there and the temperature um, is, well, what is it now? 100, 159, shall we say. The thing you want to do is to be able to drop it down to 70 within a two hour period. And that's, from that, that's the rule in terms of heated foods with milk products and, and meat products have to be able to drop out of whatever temperature they are down to 70 degrees within a two hour period. If that can be done with this, and it can be done in this, in the fridge, then you can leave it and you can be perfectly sure that it's going to be okay. So in the morning you'll be able to bring it out and I'll show you how we actually finish that off in just a moment. So we've done that as well now. Good. Now, am I right in saying I have a small hiatus. That doesn't mean to say I need an operation. Um, it is something that I have um, before I clean the decks off and start to do the omelet. I have an opportunity for questions from you that you can ask of me. And once again, I really don't care what questions you need to ask. I love the idea that I'm here in my kitchen, I'm doing the thing I love to do and I'm doing it for you and I would love to be able to interact with you. So think about that for a moment. And I, I had a... Margaret, hmm? there's some questions. Yes. So um, Lady KQ would like to know, what chefs inspired you in your early days when you were starting out? Okay. So the, the question is, what chefs inspired you in the early days? Um, well, do you know, I'm going to have to go to a non-chef for the greatest inspiration I had. There is an organization um, that is still going worldwide, and it was, it was actually started pretty well on the year of my birth, uh, which is nearly 83 years ago. And it was started by a man called André Simon. Um, and... Um, uh, he, he wanted to have a society of wine and food people and, um, and to understand about wine and understand marriage with, between wine and food. And he was one of um, my dad's customers. He, he lived just down the road from us. And, and, and he took me under his wing <coughs> in those early days and would talk to me. I think it amused him that I was, well, gosh, I was about 12, I suppose and a bit precocious. Um, I'm an only child, so I grew up in the hotel business amongst adult people all the time, so I was used to talking. And um, so he, um, he, he would express for me the joy of the table, not from a gluttonous point of view. From his thing was that if it was done really brilliantly, it was, it was like listening to a great aria or watching a great painting. It was there's something that was very well done, and he just loved that, um, and he wanted me to understand that. After many years, he came out to New Zealand. I invited him out to New Zealand to come because I'd been made vice president of the Wine and Food Society in New Zealand. And um, so he came out, and um, he wrote the introduction for my first book that I ever wrote. And... Um, was such an encourager uh, to me, I can't tell you, over my whole years. There is another um, um, chef called Ron DeSantis, who is a chef instructor at the Culinary Institute of America, and this is much more recent. And I was the first uh, visiting um, professor at the Culinary Institute of America in, New, in, in uh, Upper New York State. 
And um, he was in charge of the St. Andrew's Cafe, which was trying to do the sort of things that I now try to do. And uh, he's now um, the head chef at Yale University and doing some wonderful work there. Um, I don't think I've ever met a more friendly, wonderful person than him. Um, uh, Ron is a, just a, a, a real gentleman um, as a chef. And finally, um, there is Carl Guggenmoss, who's a Bavarian master chef. Um, and he and I are great friends. We talk to each other once a week. Uh